Climate change lie number six exposed. Our current level of CO2 is unusually high. Claim. Our current level of CO2 is unusually high. The warming alarmists try to make CO2 out to be the bad guy on beneficial global warming. They also make it out to be a toxic gas that will destroy life. Here are some people exhaling 40,000 parts per million CO2, 100 times the current level in the atmosphere. Poison? From our own lungs? <laughs> Counterclaim. Our current level of CO2 is unusually low. A quick glimpse of climate history shows that CO2 levels have been far higher than today, and life thrived. Throughout most of Earth's history, CO2 levels have only rarely been this low. Fact. Average CO2 for last 600 million years is estimated at about 2,300 parts per million. This graph of temperature and CO2 levels for the last 600 million years does have a large amount of uncertainty, but taking the nominal amount throughout that period, we come up with an average of about 2,383 parts per million. When shellfish first evolved in the ocean, CO2 varied between 4,500 and 7,000 parts per million. The notion that today's shellfish are endangered by 400 parts per million, less than a tenth that earlier level, seems questionable at best. Fact. CO2 is not a scary gas. In the first Climate Change Lies Exposed video, I included a chart that compares various levels of CO2. Lie number six, that our current level of CO2 is unusual. We currently live in a period of CO2 starvation. The average carbon dioxide level for the last few hundred million years was something like 1,600 parts per million, four times our current level. Fact, CO2 increases crop yields. In my video comparing Earth and Venus, I showed how scientists use various levels of CO2 all the way up to 20,000 parts per million. Throughout most of that range, crop yields exceeded what we get with current CO2 levels. Scientists publishing with the National Institutes of Health wrote of their experiments with wheat and rice, varying the levels of CO2. They found that yields of both plants increased with CO2 levels up to 1,200 parts per million. The increase was between 30 and 40 percent more food. That's a significant increase in food output. What about even more CO2? They found that these two species lost some of their gain if CO2 was raised to 2,000 parts per million. How much loss? About 25 percent. Still, that's a gain of about 5 to 15 percent over our current levels. What about higher CO2 levels? These scientists pushed carbon dioxide as high as 20,000 parts per million, but only lost another 10 percent total food output. So even at 20,000 parts per million, Wheat and rice yields were similar to those at 400 parts per million. Corollary claim. Increased CO2 results in decreased crop nutrition. But some studies show that increases in CO2 will decrease the nutrition of our food crops. Yes, there have been studies that show this, yet one highly publicized article in National Geographic seems to contradict its own headline using may, could be, could, might have, conflicting results, and likely. How much of a problem is it, really? Fact. Any deficits in nutrition are minimal. Another study that found nutritional deficiencies at higher CO2 concentrations was criticized for growing their crop studies in root-restrictive pots instead of more natural settings. Leifering et al. 2004 found all macronutrients and micronutrients, except nitrogen, to increase with greater concentrations of CO2, contrary to the findings of earlier studies. In concluding their paper, Leifering et al. reiterate that their study of the effects of elevated CO2 on grain elemental concentrations under real-world field conditions is, quote, the first such report for a staple food crop 
All other previously reported data were obtained from plants growing in pots and in some kind of enclosure, end quote. In contrast to the results obtained in most of these latter root-confining experiments, they note that other than for N, nitrogen, quote, no dilution of the elements in the grain was observed, contrary to the general conclusions of Loledza, 2002, end quote. In a study conducted by M. Powell, L. S. Rao et al., the scientists found that iron uptake decreased by about 12.4%, but three other micronutrients increased, manganese plus 20.9%, zinc plus 9%, and copper plus 20.1%. Another study by J. Yin et al. showed that wheat crop pests were more vulnerable to their natural enemies under higher CO2 concentrations, meaning reduced need for pesticides to protect wheat crops. And K. S. Roy et al., found that increases in both CO2 and temperature resulted in increases in the nutritional value of rice crops, the single most important crop in the world. Can't people get their vitamins and minerals from alternative sources as plants respond differently to changes in the environment? Some plants are becoming more nutritious with some minerals and less nutritious with others. On balance, it appears that there is a nutrient shift rather than a depletion. One informal study by Dr. Craig Itso suggests that most people in the West eat far more than the minimum required protein. The amount of protein reduction in some crops is insignificant compared to the total amount already consumed. One modest eater was found to consume 2.72 times the recommended daily allowance. With the feared decreases in protein from the two times higher CO2 growing environment, the individual studied would end up consuming 2.67 times the recommended daily allowance. In other words, the decrease was too small to be noticed. Fact. Nature has been slowly killing itself for millions of years. Before life became abundant on Earth, the atmosphere was thick with CO2, similar to the atmosphere of Venus today. Much of that CO2 reacted with the land and the sea floor sequestering large portions of the gas into rock, most notably calcium carbonate. The early atmosphere likely had very little elemental oxygen, but only oxygen bound up with carbon and hydrogen, CO2, and water vapor. Today's atmosphere has 210,000 parts per million oxygen. In the past, that was instead carbon dioxide. So before plant life with photosynthesis, Earth's atmosphere had at least 210,000 parts per million of CO2. That level has come way, way down. After photosynthesis had been working on the CO2 for over a billion years, levels came down to the range of 6,000 to 12,000 parts per million. Over the last 600 million years, CO2 levels have come down even further, closer and closer to zero, sequestering more and more of the gas in dead plant material. In the next million years or so, CO2 levels would have dipped below 150 parts per million during glacial periods of the current ice age, resulting in the extinction of many C3 plant species. Cold water soaks up CO2, pulling it out of the atmosphere, reducing it to dangerously low levels. Fact. Humans have saved all life on Earth by restoring CO2. Burning fossil fuels has returned a tiny amount of that carbon dioxide back into the atmosphere from whence it had come in the first place. By burning fossil fuels, humans have protected all life on planet Earth, moving the CO2 levels further away from CO2 mass extinction toward merely starvation levels. Fact. At 800 parts per million, plants were starving so much for CO2, they evolved C4 species. When CO2 levels dropped down to 800 parts per million, plants worldwide freaked out enough to evolve C4 species. This wasn't just one species, but several different species of plants, each with their own unique form of C4 carbon acquisition in parallel evolution. Species don't evolve in one common direction without a need to do so. CO2 starvation was part of the reason. The other part was the drying out of planet Earth from the steady cooling that had been ongoing for millions of years. 
Plants have breathing holes called stomata. In a way, they're like plant nostrils, allowing for the exchange of CO2 for oxygen and water vapor. In an epoch of CO2 starvation, the plants have to open their stomata wider to get sufficient CO2, but this allows water vapor to escape more readily. And in a world that was also becoming drier, plants were stressed into evolving a different method of conserving water and acquiring this much needed gas of life. Conclusion. We need more CO2, this precious gas of life. After losing at least 99.9981% of its original CO2, Earth needs to get at least a tiny amount of it back so that all life doesn't go extinct. If we were to lose all oxygen, only animals would die. And if we were to lose CO2, both animals and plants would die. Animals would still have oxygen, but without plants, they would all starve to death. How much CO2 is too much? perhaps somewhere between 2,000 and 20,000 parts per million. NASA allows its astronauts to have 20,000 parts per million for up to an hour, and 7,000 parts per million for missions requiring several months. Since life in the oceans evolved at far higher levels of CO2, it seems likely that they will be able to adjust to higher levels, especially with CO2 increasing at such a slow pace. Even one generation of sea life can adapt to dramatic environmental changes. Life is robust when it's not being poisoned. And CO2 is not and never has been a poison, a toxin, or a pollutant. Perhaps we need to focus on real problems, like corporations polluting our environment with GMOs, petrochemicals, and toxic pesticides and herbicides. Perhaps we need to eliminate corporate infiltration of the government with lobbyists, campaign funding, and the revolving door between industry and the civil service. These are real problems. Increasing CO2 in an era of carbon dioxide starvation is a good thing. <laughs>